This alien creature is an ore fish. And seeing one, even over the internet, can be a momentous occasion. If you were a 19th century sailor spotting this 30 foot long creature off the bow, you'd declare it a sea serpent and create a legend. If you were on vacation and one swam beneath your kayak, you'd take out your camera. Oh my God, look at the size of the because no one would believe that it happened otherwise. I'm taking a movie of it. And if you were a child at a museum staring up at this enormous fish, you'd think... That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. It was a fish that was, you know, way bigger than I was. It was silvery. It looked like an alien. And I thought, someday, someday I'm going to study those. Dr. Misty Peg Tran is an assistant professor of marine biology at Cal State Fullerton. Her focus is the physiology and movement of filter feeding sea creatures. Very large, usually very strange fishes, including manta rays, whale sharks, and of course, oarfish. But even though they're of monstrous proportions, finding oarfish is difficult. They are rare, at least we don't see them very often. So a lot of research into how the oarfish swims and feeds has been gleaned from fleeting glimpses in front of deep sea submersibles. We thought that oarfish probably swam more like an eel so a sort of slithery motion, but instead this fish was oriented with their head up towards the water column because it actually swims straight up and down. This position allows the fish to steady itself while gulping in tiny zooplankton, kind of like a straw. How it does this is both scientifically and visually fascinating. It has to somehow remain in the water column pretty much motionless, and so it just beats its dorsal fin, the fin on its back, very slowly in order to maintain the position in the water column so that it can pick out its food source. What enables these mesmerizing undulations? To find out, Dr. Peg Tran needed a specimen, and to get one would require pure luck, a rare beaching near her lab at Cal State. Fortunately, Southern California is believed to be a hotspot for the species. And on October 18th, 2013, I got a call from my former advisor that said, uh, Noah has oarfish, they're going to do a preliminary necropsy, and then I was going to get the rest of the oarfish. To you and me, getting 14 feet of dead fish would probably make for a smelly day. But for Dr. Peg Tran... It was kind of like going to Vegas and winning big. Next came the daunting task of detailing the skeletal structure of this slimy jackpot. Working with UCLA, she created a full-body CT scan of the fish. We have 75,000 images. If you can imagine that every millimeter there's a photograph of this fish, we then have to go through that entire series and reconstruct this animal. But with the help of her grad student, Andrew Barrios, they created a 3D model of the animal's body. In a word, it's weird. The bones are incredibly like jelly. So they're really highly bendy, but it's different than your bone or my bone in that it doesn't have cells in this bone. And its presence in the oarfish complicates matters. If you're an oarfish and you're gonna primarily be using that dorsal fin for locomotion and to keep you stable in the water, if you have jelly-like bones, it's not gonna be very easy for your muscles to work against those bones to give you leverage to move. Here's where having that CT scan comes in handy. At least the oarfish that we are now sectioning has hyperossification along its entire backbone. It has these little bulbous spots of bone that the muscles can then pull on to move the fish. Small anatomical discoveries like this can provide insight into the life of this elusive animal. But many basic questions remain, such as, how exactly this elastic skeleton combats the pressures of the deep? Or why nearly every oarfish found seems to be missing the end of its tail? It's exactly like what would happen with a reptile with the tail coming off. They actually um, can sort of self-cleave their tail, which is called autotomy. Or why these animals beach themselves in the first place. We need to start figuring out what's happening in the deep ocean. I mean, th that's really surprising to think that there's so much of our own world that we don't know about. And sometimes when we do figure it out, it becomes even more bizarre and alien than the first time we laid eyes on it. For Science Friday, I'm Luke Groskin.